Um, welcome to the session on linked data in the libraries. My name is Philip Skur, and I'm the head of the metadata department at Stanford University. And I will be speaking first um, on uh, libraries and linked data, uh, focusing on the MARC records, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and why this transformation to linked data is important and why it is so difficult to do. A revolution is on the horizon, one that is potentially as world-altering as the development of the web. <clears throat> and as most truly transformative revolutions, it is driven by a simple concept, linked data. Linked data has the potential to change every aspect of our world of information creation and exchange. And as primary purveyors of information, the library should be at the nexus of this revolution. Every aspect of our world will be dramatically altered as basic tenets of what we collect, how we collect, how we organize, and how we provide information are questioned and rethought. Much has been said about linked data, its ties to the semantic web, and its application for libraries. <clears throat> but what is it exactly, and how does it work? Linked data has so much potential because it is designed to work with the web. And as more of our professional lives move to the cloud, it is important, more and more important, the way this information is stored there. The four tenets of linked data are quite simple. First, use URIs, or uniform resource identifiers, to name things on the web. Second, use HTTP URIs so that someone can look them up. Third, have the information provided by the link be useful. And fourth, provide links to other URIs so that people can discover related information. Link data is expressed using the Resource Description Framework, or RDF. The structure of any expression in RDF is composed of a collection of triples, each triple having a subject, a predicate, and an object. This simple structure allows anyone to make assertions about anything. For instance, and this is for Baltimore, the raven, subject, has author, predicate, Edgar Allan Poe. Ideally, both subject and object would be represented by URIs, and the statement itself expressed using an XML-based syntax. The advantage of using URIs is that much more accurate matching can be made. There may be many variations in the spelling of Edgar Allan Poe. Poe, Edgar Allan, 1809 to 1849, Edgar Allan Poe, E.A. Poe, and not to mention all those typos and other variations. Uh, is it an A-N, is it an E-N, is it one L, is it double Ls? And so any machine matching you try to make by character string is very problematic. By linking to a URI, however, for Poe's authority record in the Library of Congress name authority file, the link is explicit. And by recording this information in RDF, Applications can exchange information on the web without loss of meaning. As RDF is a common language, information expressed in it can be used by many applications, and applications can be developed to take advantage of this growing pool of data. The strength of this model is that it allows anyone to make assertions about anything. What is equally as powerful is that any two expressions may be linked together, and through this process, an immensely rich web of data is created. Although it is true that there is no requirement that these statements are true, so for instance, the raven has author, Philip Skur, is equally a valid statement in RDF. It is equally as true that anyone may correct invalid statements. In this way, through an iterative use <clears throat> through an iterative use of data uh, use and correction, the web of data becomes more rich and more reliable. It's crowdsourcing at a truly international level. Since the days of the card catalog, our focus has been on bibliographic records. 
these discrete bundles of information supply metadata about resources in our collections. Their record structure is carefully controlled and access points such as names, subjects, or series come from recognized thesauri and carefully curated authority files. With our transition to, authority, <coughs> to online catalogs made possible through the development of MARC, our focus remains on bibliographic records. The information they contain is fractured into various fields and subfields and stored in relational databases where they can be associated and maintained. This fixation on bibliographic records, though, has its drawbacks. First, many institutions prefer their own particular version of a bibliographic record. Even though OCLC might espouse the use of the master record in their database, libraries are free to alter and enhance the copy of that record in their local database. Corrections who perceived errors in others cataloging, missing data elements, and local practices all can be incorporated into a local version of the record that meets local users' needs. Large numbers of staff are dedicated to this work at an enormous cost. As the number of records grow, so does the cost of attempting to maintain them all. Second, these bibliographic records are stored in relational databases, which are by definition closed systems. In order for a patron to discover a resource in an online catalog, a bibliographic record for it must be present in the system. The downside to this arrangement was driven home to me by Michael Keller, university librarian at Stanford University in the 1990s. At that time, I was head of the catalog depart department, and Mike asked me to catalog the web. <clears throat> I've puzzled over this question for more than a decade now. The question itself was very perceptive, but far ahead of its time. Our patrons were increasingly interested in what was on the web, and it was natural for us to provide access to it. However, our mechanism for providing access was both too expensive and too restrictive to provide access to nearly an infinite number of resources. Within a world of limited staffing and records in relational databases, consistent access to the web of data is an impossibility. Linked data, however, is not focused on bibliographic records, but individual statements of fact. There are no discrete records to be maintained in a local ILS, no master records in a worldwide database, simply massive collections of triples in triple stores. By bypassing the a priori need for a record, linked data frees us from the cycle of record creation, maintenance, and deletion. Valuable staff time can be freed from these activities and the confines of the relational database can be broken. But is linked data really the solution? From June 27th to July 1st, 2011, Stanford University hosted a group of librarians and technologists to examine the use of linked data in the academic environment. The hope was that in the short week allotted to us, that we could both confront the challenge of planning a multinational, multi-institutional discovery environment and lay the groundwork for its development. One of the most interesting products of the workshop <clears throat> was a series of value statements as to why the linked data approach is worthwhile pursuing. First, linked open data puts information where people are looking for it, on the web. Second, Linked data can greatly expand the discoverability of our content. Third, linked data <clears throat> opens opportunities for creative innovation in digital scholarship and participation. Fourth, by that worldwide crowdsourcing, linked data allows for open, continuous improvement of the data. Fifth, linked open data creates a store of machine actionable data on which services can be built. Sixth, linked data can help break down the tyranny of those domain silos that we've been hearing about at this conference today. And last, linked data can provide direct access to data in ways that are not currently possible by reaching into the documents themselves. 
As people shift to the web as their first point of discovery, it's important for library resources to be represented there. Although it is true that our card catalogs may appear on the web, any semantic meaning embedded in the mark coding is lost. For the most part, the data in them becomes blocks of text. Through the use of RDF, however, important information encoded by the mark tags can be translated into triples that carry semantic meaning for machine processing. And each one of the elements in the triple can be recorded as a URI that can link these data points to matching data points within the web of data. By intelligent conversion of our library mark records to machine resolvable RDF triples, the semantic meaning in the records is preserved. By moving these statements to the web, the data becomes a vital structural part of the semantic web. In the world of linked data, these mark records are a prime preliminary source of information. All of the efforts that catalogers have put into controlled subject access, controlled names, classification, and consistent description has made it extremely desirable. As any li library foray into linked data must begin with its collection of MARC records, it's worthwhile taking a look at the format itself. Take as an example a typical MARC record for a sound recording. And this is taken from our um, Discovery Environment search works. The record is quite impressive. It gives a description of the medium, the contents, the years of performance, controlled subject headings, analytical entries for all the individual musical works it contains, and displays the information in an easily digestible structure for the eye. It's simple for anyone glancing at this record to see that it represents a recording of Fritz Kreisler performing a selection of violin music. The musical works <clears throat> are clearly articulated, and responsibilities are clear from glancing at the record as a whole. But what would a machine make of this record? Much of the semantic meaning in this example can only be derived from the bibliographic record as a whole. The human eye can easily see that the main entry is Fritz Kreisler and that he is a violinist. That the piece by Joseph Sulzer is for violin and piano. And that if they like this type of music, they could follow the subject heading violin and piano music. And also that the Mozart Violin Concerto is accompanied by the London Symphony Orchestra conducted by Sir Landon Ronald. This dependence on a complete bibliographic record for semantic meaning is a holdover from the card catalog days. The MARC format allowed these records to be transformed into electronic documents and shared internationally, but they are still bibliographic records, and to be understood must be evaluated as a whole. Individual statements, such as the participant note, Fritz Chrysler, violin with various accompaniments, or the event note recorded 1904 to 1924 are meaningless, taken out of context. RDF, however, is a series of independent statements meant to be understood by a machine. The conversion of MARC to RDF has to overcome two great obstacles. The first is the concept of the bibliographic record, and the second is the inability of the MARC communication format to clearly convey semantic meaning. It's often difficult for us to realize how much information our minds supply. From the author field, we see Fritz Kreisler is listed as a creator. From the participant note, we see that he's a violinist. From the contributor fields, we see the recording includes Ephraim Zimbalis. From the contents note, we see that he is also a violinist. From the contents note, we see that Kreisler performs a piece by Tchaikovsky, Chansons Parole, that was originally for a piano. From the included works note, we see that this piece is from Tchaikovsky's work, Souvenir de Hapsal. From the subject notes, we see that the correct LCSH subject heading for this work is violin and piano music arranged. But there is nothing in the bibliographic record itself that links these bits of information together. It is the human mind that makes these logical associations. The MARC format itself was created to clearly communicate the information encoded in our card catalogs, and in this it has been very successful. Although perpetuating the concept of the bibliographic record, it very clearly articulates and differentiates all the elements in the record. 
The MARC format is used, however, almost exclusively by the library community, and much of its semantic meaning is lost to machine understanding. In the semantic world of linked data, these MARC records themselves are inarticulate. The shift to the web as a primary source of information is unarguable. And as it is impossible for us to encompass the entirety of the web in our library catalogs, our catalogs must move intelligently to the web. Our millions of bibliographic records and the resources they represent are one of the truly great treasures we have to offer the web of data. The care with which we have created, maintained, and enhanced them over time have made them a primary focus of the semantic web. But the way in which the data has been recorded in MARC prevents any intelligent automated manipulation or linking. Although a daunting challenge, this conversion of our bibliographic records from MARC to linked open data will become one of the most powerful drivers in the transformation to the semantic web placing our data and resources where people are actually looking for it and tying them intelligently to the wealth of the web. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Bowen. Um, I have two different roles at the University of Rochester. One is that I'm um, Assistant Dean for Information Management Services. And also for the last several years, I've been one of the leads on the Extensible Catalog Project where we've been developing software. Um, and um, I have to say that when we started out to develop the extensible catalog, we had no inkling that we would have anything to do with linked data. In fact, I don't think I'd heard of linked data at that point. Um, but what we found is that there seems to be a very good fit with the software that we've developed and linked data. And so I'm going to um, be um, talking about linked data today. Uh, and some of the lessons that we've learned with the extensible catalog that I think will be useful as we go forward with uh, to do exactly what Phil has described to try to take our marked data and convert it to linked data and also some of the things that we've learned with the user research that we've done for, for uh, the extensible catalog. So I'm going to be addressing four different questions today. Uh, if we're talking about linked data for libraries, why should we do it? Who should do it? How can we get started? And what are some of the possible outcomes? And again, I'm going to relate all of these to the extensible catalog. So um, Phil talked quite a bit about why we should do it. Um, and I'm going to talk about why again. So I'm going to sort of reiterate some of the things that he said. But what I'd like to do is have my remarks be in the context of the, some of the user research that we've done as part of the extensible catalog and that we've done at the University of Rochester. So we really need, to, you know, if we're going to do linked data, we need to know why it's important for our users that we do it. Uh, what is it? We, so we want to know what our users need and how, can linked data help us provide what their needs, what they need. And then I think there's an interesting role here where we're we're all looking for what, what's going to be the role of libraries in the future, that there are some things um, <clears throat> that I think that linked data can help us uh, give us some ideas there uh, about where we could go with that. So we do a lot uh, at the University of Rochester with studying scholars. This is a book that came out a few years ago, uh, edited by Susan Gibbons and Nancy Freed Foster, uh, studying students. Um, where we studied undergraduate students. Uh, we had um, uh, a follow-up book that came out about a year ago, which is called Scholarly Practice, Participatory Design, and the Extensible Catalog. And is co-edited by uh, a variety of people from several of the different XE user research partners um, that contributed to the project. Um, so um, anyway, these two, um, uh, the work that we've done with the Extensible Catalog, I, I'd like to show you very quickly some of the findings that we have. Um, some of them f reflect things that libraries are already doing, and some of them, I think, give us some ideas of what scholars need where li libraries may be able to have a role in the future. So with that in mind, uh, here's some, some of our findings. The first one is that scholars want to read everything on the topic that they're researching. Well, we sort of know that, and we've been trying to assist them in doing that for, for a long time. Scholars want to be in the middle of everything they need, all organized so it's findable and usable. Again, that's something that libraries have tried to provide. They want their, scholars want their research to be findable and usable by others. Well, we've tried to do that as much as possible uh, and um, through institutional repositories, whatever. Um, in this particular slide, um, I'm showing a, um, a researcher page that we've developed for our institutional repository that will try to bring the scholars, uh, uh, bring them more visibility there. So we've started, libraries have started to do some work in this area. 
Scholars want to connect to people whose work is interesting and useful to them. Well, this is something where libraries haven't really done a whole lot there, but you know, again, it's something we knew and it's something that the user research confirmed. Scholars don't care what the technology is as long as it helps them to do their work. So, um, and put the, another way, um, you know, they want the technology to be in the background. They don't want it to get in, way, in the way of what they're trying to do. They want to just do their work. But one of the major findings that we're seeing is that we're really seeing yet another shift in how people seek and use inf information. One is uh, we, we've known that um, scholars bypass library, uh, library uh, discovery systems. They go right to Google. Uh, they go right to search engines. Um, but we're finding that in addition to doing that, it gets even worse. They're not even going right to Google, but they're also doing uh, work in their own applications. These could be uh, web-based applications, mobile apps, uh, 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 social networks, whatever. Um, that, uh, so they're not only just bypassing us for the search engines, they're bypassing us for other apps that are providing what we are not able to provide for them. So it's sort of another layer on top of what we, the bad news that we had before. So here's a quote from my colleague Nancy Fried Foster, who is the director of the um, all of the user research at the U of R. Even scholars who continue to use library finding tools are turning to new applications to aggregate and analyze information in ways that extend their scholarship beyond what manual searching and analyzing allows. So that means that even the ones that are still using our applications are not really getting what they need from them. They're going elsewhere. So that's, that's sort of the bad news. So what we need to do, obviously, to address this, I think, is we need to make our resources discoverable on those apps that they're already using, whether it's search engines, and we know that you know, we need to make our resources discoverable through Google and Google Scholar, but also through mobile apps and social media. And here's where we, um, um, link data has a real opportunity to provide that for us. So you know, one of the problems, I think, with linked data is that it's all back-end stuff. It's how we present the data. It's how we do the metadata. We put it in triples and things. And it's very hard to envision how that could help our users. So I've come up with an example. This is a um, hypothetical app that we could develop um, to try to uh, help our users. And so I'm going to just sort of go through it and then talk about how linked data might relate to it. So my example, it uses a cemetery that is right next to the river campus um, at the um, University of Rochester. Mount Hope Cemetery is one of the, it's actually the first municipal cemetery, rural municipal cemetery in the country that started in 1838. And um, some of the, um, uh, um, residents, I guess, of the cemetery are some very well-known people. There are some very famous uh, and beautiful monuments there. And in fact, this cemetery is the, um, the subject of a course taught at the U of R called uh, Speaking Stones. Uh, a professor of religion, Emil Homerin, has students go out, choose a monument, and then research the person who's buried in that particular gravesite. So um, this is another uh, little view here. Uh, Google Maps uh, or um, Google Earth. On the left-hand side um, is the U of R campus. You can see the buildings there. And on the right-hand side, you can see the winding um, uh, pathways of the cemetery. You can see that it's right next door. So, um, so we envision an app where someone is walking through the cemetery with a mobile device, and uh, GPS-enabled mobile device, and they come across a gravesite. In this case, Susan B. Anthony. So they take their device, and they, um, they click on that and it, the device tells, knows exactly where they are and the device takes them, the app takes them directly to materials in our special collections on Susan B. Anthony. So we're pushing the information about our uh, local collections right out there to our users. So um, this is sort of a cool idea. Um, have we built this app? Well, no, we haven't. Uh, we could build this app. And what would it take to build this app? It would take a lot of dedicated programming to try to do this. We could do this, a lot of hard coding. But what if, instead of doing it based on the way we would do it now, we had this, I'm, here I'm quoting from one of the linked open data value statements that Phil um, mentioned earlier, what if we had a store of machine actionable data that we could build improved services upon? We could do this so much more easily. The data would be out there. Application developers could just grab it and use it in their applications. So uh, this is really the vision where I think we want to go with linked data. So I'm going to move, uh, change gears and talk about who should create library linked data. And I'm going to uh, right off give you my opinion in, 
that is as many libraries as possible should be creating linked data. And uh, this was, is, actually came up in the last session that I attended this morning, where uh, on the uh, DPLA we were talking about, um, there was a question at the end about, well, you know, isn't there a problem with duplication of data? Maybe, you know, who should be doing this? Should, you know, should we expose this? Should we expose that? So I'm going to um, give you some um, uh, my rationale for why I think as many libraries as possible ought to be doing this. First of all, as Phil said uh, and explained very well, uh, linked data is a whole new paradigm. We're used to thinking of our metadata as records. A record is we create the record, then it moves over here, it gets updated, it gets moved over here, it gets augmented, it gets deleted. Records, records, records moving through. Um, we're now talking about statements, just a statement. Uh, a linked data, uh, an RDF triple that makes one assertion about a resource, and those are going to live out there somehow and get updated and all of that. And it's a really, really different way to think about data. And I think uh, what I've seen so far is that um, uh, library uh, metadata people, catalogers, have a hard time kind of grasping that. And my um, belief is that what we really need is a way to get hands-on experience with this, to really kind of grasp what this means for the library world and what the potential is. So reason number two, uh, to serve the unique needs of local users. And I think that the Mount Hope Cemetery example is an, is, is an example of that. Rather than having um, one um, entity create linked data that the whole world is going to use, everybody has, linked da has data about their local resources. They have institution repository data. They have users that have their own needs. So we have this class where we have students doing you know, research on cemeteries. Um, we could create things for that if we have our own data out there. Reason number three, we need to encourage our vendors to implement linked data. And the first part of that is educating them about linked data. And I'm sorry to say I had a rather uh, a kind of a, a <clears throat> unnerving experience with this at midwinter. I was on a panel with some of our vendor colleagues. And we were asked specifically to talk about what our various software uh, applications did regarding linked data. And one of our uh, well-respected, very well, uh, well-known vendor reps stood up and said, Yes, our software does link data. We link directly from the URL to the full text. <laughs> not understanding that that's not what we're talking about at all. And one of the unfortunate things is that the word link data, it's so generic it could mean just about anything. So there's a huge um, education there. Now I wonder if this vendor was maybe uh, uh, engaging in some uh, selective ignorance um, because their system didn't do link data and that way it sort of looked good. But anyway, we, that's, that's another, uh, uh, another topic. But we need to know what it is. We need to have an understanding of what it is, why it's important, so that we can press them to move forward with it. Uh, and then finally, why we should create linked data, because there are new opportunities that linked data provide for us. Um, and these can be in the area of new roles for library expertise um, that we can offer to our scholars by having linked data as a tool that we use. And again, uh, the linked open data value statement, as Phil um, quoted them, opportunities for creative innovation in digital scholarship and participation. So that's where we want to go. So how can we get started? Well, we, first thing we need is we need some kind of a tool to create linked data. We need to take all of our legacy data, uh, our marked data, and we need to create linked data out of it. And uh, what I'd like to um, talk about with the, for really the rest of the, uh, my presentation is how we think the extensible catalog could play a part in that. So what is the extensible catalog? It is software, open source software, we've been developing over the last few years. We provide both a discovery system and a set of tools. Uh, and the tools can uh, allow us to manage metadata and also to build applications on top of them. Um, so it's really the tool part that I'm going to talk more about today. We have four toolkits that are available at our website, extensiblecatalog.org. Our funding has come from the major funding from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, we also have received considerable funding from several uh, sponsors and partners, uh, Carly Consortium in Illinois, Kyushu University in Japan, uh, UNC Charlotte, and of course from the University of Rochester. This is a really exciting time 
for, uh, for XC because uh, we've been developing the software for several years and we've really been working to create a very robust system and we have our first XC sites up and running right now. We have a, a demo site that you can go to the um, XC um, uh, website and that's what you're seeing here. You can take a look at that and play with it. This again is our discovery interface. We have our first um, production site up at, um, this is uh, Kyushu University in Japan. They call it their cute catalog. Um, and uh, they have uh, a, it, both a Japanese and an English version of the interface. Um, so this is really built on top of their ILS data as an alternative for their ILS. Uh, another example, uh, um, Tufts University developer is um, working on um, using some of our toolkits as the background for the Perseus Digital Library. So we have some non-MARC um, digital library uh, usage going on right now. So, it's, um, so those are the first ones, and we hope that you'll start to see a whole lot more implementations of XE. It's really, we're really exciting. It's been a long time coming, so we're really excited about that. So let me talk about XC and its potential for linked data. What we offer right now with XC is a platform for experimentation with metadata and metadata transformation and reuse. Um, and potentially we could do it also for linked data. So we're not doing linked data right now, but this is where we see the potential going forward. And I think it's this, the whole idea of experimentation is something that I really want to emphasize because um, I think if you have gone to any other presentations on linked data, heard people talk about it, you realize that we really don't know how to do this, that this is a whole new area that we're going to be uh, em embarking on. And uh, we need to be able to do something and try it out and see what works. And if it doesn't work, we start over and try it a different way. So uh, XC is, uh, uh, could be a platform cr for creating linked data. We already do bulk conversion of exi existing library metadata. We have done a ton of work with MARC data, MARC holdings data, MARC bibliographic data, um, and trying to get as much value as we can out of our bibliographic record. So it, it, it stands to reason we, that that would be sort of the, the groundwork for um, using linked data. Uh, we can synchronize the data conversion uh, among uh, existing systems. And again, this uh, risk-free way to experiment with the data. We can put the data through XE, we can do a conversion, and if we look at the result and we think, you know, this isn't really what we want, we throw it away, we start over, we haven't done anything to harm the original metadata, and we can experiment. Uh, we also have the potential to make the linked data available to developers in multiple ways, multiple formats. So we think that, again, this will be very important as we go forward. So here's the architecture picture. I have to show the architecture picture. Um, so the four blue boxes are the four toolkits that we've produced or that we've developed for XC. They are all available right now. Um, they, it, you can see it's a very modular system, a very modular architecture, and we think that that's one of the reasons why it's going to be really useful. Down at the bottom are the repositories in green where you would originally get your metadata. Uh, I'm not going to go through this fairly uh, in detail, but it, the red arrows coming out of the green boxes, that's the metadata and that's sort of the pipeline of metadata coming through the various toolkits and then ending up in the user interface. The orange uh, arrows represent circulation data going back the other way. So we're just going to concentrate on the red arrows. So that's how the whole system looks. And for, as far as linked data is concerned, it's these two that are really of interest. The one on the left is the Drupal toolkit, which is where our front end uh, user interface lives. The MST is the metadata services toolkit, which is where all of the bulk processing um, takes place in, uh, in our system. So uh, the title of my talk was that um, XC can produce linked data ready. Uh, um, is linked data ready software. And I think there's two aspects to that. One is that the software itself uh, is linked data ready. And I'll show you, you know, how the software itself could produce linked data. And then I'll talk about how the data itself that we produce is linked data ready. So we have really, we've identified three different ways that we could provide linked data using the software that we've developed with some additional software development. Uh, one way to do that would be to produce RDF XML harvestable record sets. Uh, we could do that as output from the MST with developing a little bit, uh, an extra service to do that. 
Second way we could do it is to provide a Sparkle endpoint, which would enable people to, uh, developers or app other applications in particular, to query for information on demand. Both of these two options, the Sparkle endpoint and the RDF XML output, uh, would be uh, uh, developed on top of the MST, which is where we do all the bulk metadata conversion. We also have a third option, um, Drupal, um, uh, Drupal 7, the next version of Drupal, um, uh, enables um, the inclusion of RDFA, which is another format for linked data, right in the website, right in the user interface. So that would be uh, yet another way we could produce linked data uh, right in the user interface. So again, we think that there's a lot of um, different ways that we could do this, and um, producing linked data in more than one way I think would be useful. We'll find out you know, exactly what application developers need and for what purpose, and you know, again, if we don't like it, we can go back and, and create different data. So I talked about how the software itself is linked data ready. Let me shift gears and talk about how the library metadata itself that we're producing is, um, is linked data ready. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the first thing we've done is that we have an underlying schema that we use in the system. When we created that schema, we were very careful to ensure that we used only registered element sets from registered vocabularies. Um, to, and by doing this, it's going to really facilitate conversion of this internal schema into RDF triples. Um, that is, every one of the, um, the elements that we're using in the schema already has its own URI. Let me show you. Um, this is a diagram of an RDF triple. So uh, similar to what Phil showed you earlier, on the left is the subject, the middle is the predicate, and the um, right-hand side is the object. So this particular example, this resource has subject Poets American. And there's a box right here about around the predicate because when I'm talking about the schema elements, I'm really talking about the predicate here. So what the statement, the assertion that we're making about each, each resource, this one is that has subject, is something that comes from a, a registered element set. And the ones that we're using in XC, uh, we're using all the Dublin Core terms. We are using a subset of RDA elements and role designations. Uh, resi designators, excuse me, um, and of course those are all registered in the open metadata registry so we can just grab those and use those and they're all ready for linked data. Uh, and then in a few cases we had to create a few of our own properties and those will, are being registered in the link, uh, open metadata registry as well. The second way that we think that is very useful for uh, making metadata that's linked data ready is that we are incorporating uh, the Ferber data model, uh, the Ferber Group 1 entities, if you're familiar with Ferber at all, that's work expression manifestation. Um, and we are converting mark data to Ferber entities uh, as that's the first thing that we do. And we think that this is a way that we can uh, uh, enable us to produce more meaningful linked data than we might be able to do without the Ferber part in there. Now the reason we're doing the Ferber part is because we have that as an, uh, the underlying um, structure behind our uh, discovery interface. So we were doing that anyway. And we started to look at, well, is this a good thing for linked data or not? But what we see is, so this is what we're doing. We have a Mark XML bibliographic record and we parse it into three linked records with um, links between them. So we have a work expression and manifestation. So that's, that's what we're doing. And here's, uh, now here we're talking about um, the value added here that we're doing in Ferber would be the URI for the resource itself. So the left side of the, um, of the, pred of, of the RDF triple here is where we would see the value. So if we were going to create uh, an RDF triple about uh, a MARC record and the data in a MARC record without using Ferber, it might look something like this. This MARC record bibliographic num bib record number has this author, J.K. Rowling. So we're actually making statements about uh, a MARC record, which as we're moving away from MARC, maybe we don't want to do. So if we're, uh, by using the, uh, the parsing that we're already doing to create the, uh, the Ferber entities, we can make statements then about a Ferber entity. So we can say that this work has creator J.K. Rowling. This 
expression has language English. This manifestation has an ISBN, and this is the ISBN number. So we're not making assertions anymore in our linked data statements about MARC records, but about something that the library community has said is very important to it, and that's the FERBER model. And of course, FERBER is the underlying uh, data model for RDA, the new library um, uh, content uh, uh, standard for metadata. Um, so it, this seems like it ought to be something that would be uh, valuable to, um, to uh, uh, look into for the library community. So, um, so why should we do this with the Ferber part? Um, again, our user research has shown that um, users want to see the relationships between resources. So we, this is why you know, we built a, a metadata standard on top of Ferber, because it's important. Um, so since we're already doing it with XC, we can find out whether this really is important or not. So it's yet another way that we can um, uh, look at whether the value, uh, look at the value of the Ferber model and evaluate whether it's useful. Um, we also believe that um, we don't have to be wedded to that as far as uh, using XC to produce linked data. We could also use other data models as well. But since we're already doing the Ferber, it seems like a really, really interesting opportunity. So what might be some of the possible in, um, outcomes of doing linked data? Uh, and I'm going to revisit here some of the user research findings that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, connecting scholars with others, um, making scholars work findable, and um, developing technology that helps um, uh, scholars to do their work. Um, I've developed a couple of um, uh, use cases that seem that I think relate to these that I think we could do with linked data, and I've tried to put them in the form of an RDF statement for each one of these. So these are just sort of to give some ideas of where we might be going. So um, some ideas of tools we could develop. Um, we could allow scholars to create linked data as part of the work that they're already doing so that they wouldn't have to say, oh, now I have to learn how to create linked data. We could develop a tool that will enable it to just be linked data and add it to the linked data cloud as a result of the work they're already doing. Um, citation relationships, I think, are very important uh, area that we could explore here because, again, citations are all relationships. I cited this work. He cited me. Um, creating and managing vocabularies. Uh, scholars do this from time to time, and librarians are really good at this. So there's a natural area that we could, we could offer um, value added to our scholars. Um, enabling experts to augment metadata that we've already created with information they know about a resource and to have that information then be uh, expressed as linked data. So here are some of my examples. Uh, my thesis is based on this data set. So there we have something that could be expressed as a triple. The, the thesis may be in your institutional repository. If you could create a linked data statement that links out to the data set, then you suddenly you have that relationship um, uh, documented and anybody else that uses that data set, whatever, um, can um, take advantage of that as linked data. These photographs are all of the same person. So again, we're making a statement about this is the same as this. Uh, again, this is the kind of thing that researchers are doing all the time. And uh, that can be stated as linked data and could be out there in the data cloud um, as something that they're contributing as part of their research. These other researchers are citing my research. So we sort of turned it around as far as uh, you know, uh, uh, what's cited in this particular uh, article, but what a researcher is really, or a scholar is really caring about is who's citing my stuff so that I can get credit for it and I can uh, demonstrate my value. And again, I think there's some linked data possibilities there. So um, just to reiterate how XC can facilitate linked data, uh, we have open source software, um, risk-free experimentation with MARC, which is obviously a good place where we start because we have this huge investment in MARC data, um, and also other um, uh, library metadata, and we can manipulate that data. We have the potential for creating um, bulk conversion of linked data. We have three different ways that we could do that with some additional development. Uh, and uh, so we've already done a lot of the heavy lifting with doing the metadata conversion, uh, all the, um, you know, sort of the back end processing of the MARC data. And uh, with some additional development on top of that, we think we could, we could do uh, any one of those three ways or all three. Um, and we also think that like XC would be a, um, a really useful platform developing for developing some of those linked data applications and tools, such as I described, that really could start to address some of the needs of, of scholars. 
So the next steps for XC and link data, we are seeking funding to do the development of the link data work. Um, and also, we want to do, an, when we develop software, we always do user research at the same time. So we would do both at the same time. And we would love to have libraries uh, to partner and participate with us in that effort. So thank you very much. And I, I think we have about 10 minutes. We can take questions for both of us. My name is Vinod Chatra, and my question is for Jennifer. I really enjoyed your presentation and how you described linked data. And as you know, we've been working with Ferber and RDA for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem that's coming up. When you take these bibliographic records and convert them to triples, you get a whole volume of data. I mean, the content becomes larger and larger as you go. So in one of your examples, you said expression ID has language mm -hmm. English. Now, given that there are 150 languages in the world or so forth, we could potentially have 150 assertions that instead of doing a direct link like you did, expression ID has language English, we could simply say expression ID has assertion ID, and it's one of 150's assertion IDs, which compacts the data but increases the reference. Correct? Is that advisable or not is what I'm going to ask you. I honestly don't know, Vinod. <laughs> it's a, yeah, I don't know. You know, and, and I, I think one of the things we don't know with linked data is whether the volume of data is going to be an issue when we start putting it into triple stores, and how much. You know, uh, so I, I guess the answer, to my, my answer is, I really don't know. I think it's a very interesting question, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk more about about it with you and why. You know, I, I hesitate to answer because I'm not one of the people that, who is a real expert on linked data syntax and what's, you know, what's, what's legal and what's not and whether that somehow breaks something. And so I, so I guess I'm hesitant to, to respond to that. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think this is, I, I, I'll just reiterate my point is that we really need to experiment and we need to try various things and find out whether what you're suggesting, you know, whether it works better, whether it, you know, whether the, the duplication of data and the, you know, the, the, um, the volume of data ends up not being a problem in a totally linked data world. So I think that's really an open question. If anybody else would like to answer Hi. that, I'd be happy to. <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> not you. Um, <laughs> But I do have another question. So your example showed uh, a predicate, you know, that was a locally namespaced Rochester relationship. So, and also, so my question really has to do with, um, in addition to just having RDF, don't we need centralized sources of ontologies and predicates as well as um, how do you match the information within the MARC record to, the, to which source vocabulary source? As the, as the link. You know, for your Edgar Allan Poe, is it necessarily the Library of Congress name authority or there's right. some other name authorities? And how do, you, how do you map what's in the MARC records in your catalog to a specific instance? Yeah. We absolutely need to do all of that. And that's, that's, again, where a lot of the work is going to need to be done to make sure that we do this right. And, and there are a few vocabularies out there that we can try to use right away. Um, but certainly there are others that we need to figure out how we're going to do that and how we're going to map across vocabularies from one to the other. I think, you know, the, the predicates we're using are the registered schemas. I think what you were uh, referring to is maybe the subject part, which is the, the uh, refers to a URI generated by XE software. And is that what you were looking at? That's the, that's the Rochester part of that. Other questions or comments? I guess I would add one other comment to that. You know, it's um, in the work that we've been thinking about with linked data, you know, there's two sort of different thoughts about that idea of authority control and how it works. In the work that we do now, we think a lot about authority files and having that central 
point to be able to link to. And there may be multiple different authority files. There could be MIMAS, there could be LCNAF, there could be a number, and then we could link those points together and make this sort of web of interconnections. Um, but there are other automated means of doing that linking, and um, so there's organizations like Same As that will have, by machine processing, look at these names and say this is most likely the same person with an 80% probability, and we'll link them up. Um, I was speaking with some developers at IBM a couple of years ago, and they said, they said, uh, they could process the information on the web, and with 80% guaranteed rate, they would be able to link up the names that were the same in an automated way. So, you know, there's sort of two different approaches we have in the library world, our, our desire to create those authority records um, as linking points, and then also there's the side that says, well, we can do it by an automated means with a high percent of accuracy, so which is the best approach to take? So there are definitely those two different camps of people thinking about this. Um, as a head of a metadata department, I do like authority records, um, but I'm thinking their use may become not so much as that anchor point for which, of course, they're very useful, but because of the additional information that can be put in them um, that could become very useful as far as identifying who that person is and a bunch of other, it's just a place to put all that information mm -hmm. um, and makes them very useful. Um, question and a comment. I'll state the question first. Um, is the um, mark to linked open data a good idea that's being explored at this point in time, or are there action items that will allow Stanford or other participating schools to uh, move forward on this with some vigor? And uh, quickly, my comment was that uh, I understand that billion triple, triple stores have already been successful and probably trillion triple stores will be right behind and of course it won't be long before we have uh, uh, trillion bytes of disk for a dollar so I'm not worried about the uh, about needing to compactify the data. Do you want to address that? Um, so when I think about uh, linked data in the billions and triple billions and trillions of triple stores, um, I think to me it gets back to that idea people always talk about of the killer app, which is one of those things everyone always says needs to be developed. So in the world that we have right now, we have, um, to me, a very small world. We have our bibliographic records. Uh, we can't possibly create catalog records for everything we'd like to be able to contain. Um, so to me, there, the difficulty is that the world is too small. So now at Stanford, we're thinking about all the other things the university produces in its day-to-day -day activities. So we've got, you know, reading lists, we've got data sets. Um, there's all sorts of valuable research that goes on. Far too much for us to create a catalog record for. So we want to try to capture all that information. Um, so instead, we're faced with a world where there's too much information, you know, where we can't possibly make um, a, uh, make some sort of uh, creative or useful um, world of use out of all those billions in, of triple store, uh, triples. So we're going to need to find that app, which instead of the downside is not too little information, but too much information. So how do we sift through all of that to be able to make these useful, display the useful links to people without having them be overwhelmed by this, this amount of data that's out there? So that is going to be one of the real challenges, uh, is the manipulation of those triples and to present that information in a reasonable way. Just to um, follow up on the, the first question that you asked um, was, you know, do, can we go ahead now to work on Mark? Yeah, I, and a lot of different places are experimenting with that in a lot of different ways. And, uh, you know, so I think um, with the extensible catalog, what we want to do is enable more people to do that experimentation. But, yeah, there, I think we, you know, the time is now, you know, to really see what we can do with it. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, Patrick O'Brien, University of Utah. Um, I had a question uh, concerning about your tool set or, or development tools that you have available now, particularly what uh, can we convert the MARC record to in terms of ontologies that are available, and then what tools are available to improve the quality of the data? 
Um, so, for example, deduping um, what is the meaning of, of the particular um, uh, element within the data. So, um, uh, an example is um, time period. The creation date, was that the date it was published or is that the date in which it was written about? So, it might be um, um, an article written about the Civil War, but it was written now, or it might have been something written during the Civil War time period about something in the future. How do we go about determining um, the meaning of the data? Well, I think that for, um, you know, in the, in the library uh, world, the way we've done that is through having content standards where um, we have defined, you know, what is the meaning of that data. Um, Unfortunately, you know, the, you know, our tradition of doing that has not been very machine actionable. They've been, you know, text documents. Um, and what we're looking at now is a real period where we're converting from, um, you know, this um, Mark ACR2 world to um, an RDA world. And, uh, you know, I, I, one of my other hats used to be to work on RDA development. So when we started working on RDA, again, we didn't know about linked data. We didn't really know the value of uh, registering the data elements. We, didn't, we weren't thinking in terms of a, a data dictionary where you would be able to have a registry of metadata elements, and that registry, registry will tell you exactly what that data element means and what it refers to. Uh, but luckily, that work has gone on with RDA, so there is a registry now where you can look up. Once we, once we make that shift from our old standard to our newer standard, we'll be able to do that. And then it's a matter of taking all of our le legacy data and you know mapping that in ways that make sense. But I, I guess it's my question mess, is, but we'll get there. Okay, so it's we can't use the tools to do that yet. Um, I think we will be able to with RDA uh -huh. data because the registry is there and we do have some RDA data that's now being produced. Uh, unfortunately, the RDA data is in MARC, you know, so we're trying to provide other opportunities for having RDA and other data, um, you know, and other schemas that will make it more usable. It's a, it's, I think we're in kind of a messy transitional period, but I think we're going, we're, we've got some of the pieces in place to go where we need to go. Anyone else? Well, thank you all. Um, we've got a couple minutes. We'll, we can hang around and if you have other questions.